Well, first of all, it is it is truly astounding. It, uh, if, if the country had mirrored our per capita death rate, there would be a little bit more than 100,000 deaths, not 500,000. So about four to five times better than the national rate. A bunch of reasons, I think. You know, there's some natural advantages to San Francisco. It's not brutally cold in the winter. A lot of tech workers who can uh, work on Zoom and go, uh, be on Netflix at night. The Department of Public Health is extraordinarily good and has a very strong relationship with UCSF, and that helps. I think, by and large, the biggest reason was very good decision making by our leaders, and and people tended to listen. There was very little pushback against the public health. Uh, recommendations. You didn't hear anything about liberate San Francisco. Uh, you know, people basically said, we follow the science, we believe it, and we're going to be careful. And the proof is in the pudding. And I think it de demonstrates what could have happened in the United States had uh, the political messaging been better and had people been um, more uniformly uh, engaged and in touch with the, with the recommendations. You said there were some good decisions made. Were there decisions made in San Francisco that weren't made in the rest of the country? We uh, we closed down earlier than other places. So, and some of that was corporate leaders rather than 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 the uh, government leaders. So, you know, Twitter and Facebook and Google all sent people home in late February, a couple of weeks before anybody else. And you might say, well, because they can, because people are largely digital and they could work from home. But it, it sent a very strong message to everybody. You know, I remember hearing that and I basically said, if Google thinks that this is a big deal, it probably they're smarter than I am. <laughs> they have people everywhere. It's probably a big deal. So I think there was messaging from early on that this was real and important and we should follow the science. And then the city shut down sooner than any other major city. The state shut down sooner than any other state. And I think it set a tone that this is serious stuff. Let's take it seriously. And I think that tone persisted. Through the pandemic, uh, you know, we had little surges, but nothing terrible. And it was interesting because California as a whole was doing incredibly well for the first half of it, including Los Angeles. And then in this latest surge, Los Angeles and Southern California got creamed and San Francisco had a mild surge, but nothing very bad. So there was some divergence in the state. And I think that was largely because in LA, the uh, uh, first of all, it's 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 a it's a less of a techie place. There are more people that have jobs where they have to go out. That's real, but I think the issue was mostly sort of political and cultural. I think in L.A., people let their guard down, and in San Francisco, uh, for a variety of reasons, they never did. I just reminded our listeners that you have a chance to ask uh, Dr. Wachter your questions. We'll take them. I just put them in the Q and A. Um, San Francisco has a relatively large underserved population, a large homeless uh, population. Uh, how did you fare with respect to those populations in COVID? Reasonably well. I mean, we always feared a big outbreak among uh, the homeless, and there was certainly some cases, but nothing dire. Uh, our biggest fear was a big, we have a thousand bed nursing homes run by the city uh, called Laguna Honda. And there were a few cases early on, and we thought this could be, you know, this could be the disaster. And it turned out, I don't think anybody died in it, and it turned out to be a handful of cases. We, UCSF and San Francisco General, pitched in with the Department of Public Health and really kind of aggressively attacked that and managed to hold that at bay. It turned out that the biggest, uh, uh, you know, uh, brush fire in San Francisco was in San Quentin Prison, which is in Marin County, where there was a devastating outbreak. Um, and it turned out, ironically, I guess, that it was it was started when there were some uh, prisoners that were transferred to San Quentin from Southern California to relieve overcrowding down there. And then you had something like 70% of San Quentin Prison's population uh, get, in, get infected. But otherwise, the homeless population did reasonably well. There's a lot of attention in San Francisco to that population. And as uh, you, we run Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital as the safety net provider, and it's really quite good. And I think the, the you know, we, we, we focused on that population quite a bit and we were, and, and also I think just got lucky. Uh, let me ask you a little bit about the future. Uh, new, co new cases of COVID are down 75% since the peak in January. According to one estimate, some 70 million Americans have already been infected by COVID-19. 45 million Americans have received at least one vaccination dose. 20 million are fully vaccinated. FDA just authorized a third a vaccine for use in the U.S. Is the worst of the pandemic behind us? I think so. I mean, I, I, it's, you know, one thing COVID has taught us is that when you think you're here ahead, uh, it comes out with some surprise. Uh, you know, the year has been 
extraordinarily surprising with all sorts of twists and turns. This will make a hell of a good movie when we're done. Um, and you know, and it, it may not longer be a surprise, but I think now we're really in this dramatic race between vaccination and the variants. And I think the best evidence and the best predictions would say that we are likely to win, that there may be a plateau in what right now is a free fall in cases. There might even be something of a fourth surge. But when you look at the speed with which vaccination is occurring, the approval of the, the, the third vaccine in the J&J, &J. Uh, today it was announced that Merck is going to help J&J &J manufacture more doses. Uh, I think you know the, the 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 original rollout of vaccination was uh, was a disaster, but I think the feds have gotten on top of it, and many states have figured out some of the moving pieces. Um, I think you would say that the forces for good outweigh the forces of evil. Now you know more vaccines, a lot of people being willing to take them, rolling out better. Uh, a lot of natural immunity. You said 70 million. I think there are even estimates of 100 million, that it's maybe 4x of the number of people that have known infection. So if, if you take that and you take the number of people vaccinated, you're up to maybe half of the adult population already at least partly protected and projections that we're going to be up to 60 or more percent by the end of, end of March, uh, early April. Uh, the variants are scary and new reports of the ones in New York that, that it may have some vaccine resistant properties. You have to watch it very carefully. But even in countries that have very high proportions of variants, the UK, for example, Israel, uh, for example, uh, cases are coming down rapidly. California, we now know that there's this California variant that does appear to be more infectious. Cases are coming down very rapidly. So although the variants are nastier and run a little faster than the, than the old virus, it appears that if we're on top of it and can get people vaccinated, we're probably going to win the race. I think the scariest thing is whether we see the emergence of truly vaccine-resistant variants that are both vaccine-resistant and more infectious. So far, it looks like the South African variant is somewhat vaccine resistant, but not all that more infectious. The UK variant is more infectious, but not vaccine resistant. If those two things come together, then we have a problem. But uh, at least so far, it doesn't look like it's happening. Is the global pandemic over? No, <laughs> I wish. I mean, you look at the, the, the numbers, you know, there are uh, massive numbers of cases all over the world. We're really uh, just beginning the struggle to vaccinate the world. I think understandably, in most countries uh, that can afford to do so are starting with their own populations. Uh, but very quickly, they need to uh, recognize that not only is it in their moral, uh, it's a, not only is it a moral imperative, but it's in their self-interest to get everybody else vaccinated. And I think when you look at what's happening in the U.S., you know, with with uh, the uh, the J and J vaccine coming online. I won't be surprised if AstraZeneca comes online. I won't be surprised at all if it's announced soon that uh, that that people who have had prior COVID only need one dose of uh, of uh, Moderna or Pfizer. We're going to have uh, probably a glut of vaccines starting in May or June, and I think the nanosecond that we do, we have to really you know lean into a worldwide campaign to vaccinate the rest of the world. Until we do, you know, none of us are safe. We can reach something that appears like herd immunity in the United States, but the combination of variants and global infection is still going to put us at risk. So we're in this mess for a while, uh, but at least in the U.S., I think things are looking pretty decent, and I think it's likely that we'll be back to something that closely resembles normal by late summer. Uh, looking back, well, what's the biggest lesson that you take away from COVID-19? Um, John Barry, who wrote the wonderful book, The Great Influenza, about the 1918 uh, flu pandemic, uh, wrote an editorial in the New York Times in July. And he said, uh, his first line was something like, uh, when politics meets science, you get politics. And that's the biggest lesson. I mean, I, I, none of us uh, prepared for the possibility that, the, uh, that this thing would become so politicized it should have been a time for unity. It should have been a time for us coming together and fight a common foe. And I think had we done that, hundreds of thousands of lives would have been saved. How do you prevent that the next time? I don't know any more than I know how we got ourselves into the predicament that led to the problem. But but uh, the, the the political response was uh, was disastrous. And 
uh, and led to uh, you know hundreds of uh, hundreds of thousands of unnecessary deaths and and, and untold amounts of of hardship. Uh, the other lesson is that science is extraordinary. Uh, you know, if you told I I do not, I've spoken to a whole lot of world class virologists. I have not met a single one who predicted that we would have two remarkably safe, remarkably effective vaccines ten months after the first cases were reported. I mean, that's just that's just staggering. So we have the ability to get on top of the world's hardest problems. That gives me a little confidence for climate change uh, if we can just get the politics under control. And I think those two lessons almost compete in our brains for sort of the good and the bad. One silver lining of the COVID pandemic has been the rise of digital health. Uh, for example, in the last year, we saw a hundredfold increase in use of telemedicine among Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, what has you most excited? I think the I think that's it. I think the telemedicine, you know, pandemics and other crises tend to engender innovation. They push people to sort of cut through uh, the thicket of, of of culture and stasis and inertia and all that to kind of move forward more quickly. So telemedicine is a perfect example of a technology that was was technologically ready for prime time five ten years ago, but not ready for prime time kind of culturally and politically. And by culturally, I mean, you know, a lot of doctors are resistant to it. I, you know, I know many of my colleagues who say, I can't do a televisit. I need to lay on the hands. <laughs> I mean, these were like ID doctors. And it's like, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> you know, the neurologists are doing telemedicine and they got the hammer and they got the tuning fork and you need to lay on the hands. What? Come on. So I, th and, and I think for patients as well, they didn't understand how it could work. So Fear is a great catalyst uh, for change. And I think it induced all of us to try it. And when we tried it, it was, everyone said, oh, you know, this works okay. Patients like it actually better than they like in-person visits. For many clinicians, it was, it was surprisingly effective and surprisingly satisfying. And then we came to realize that a lot of the barriers were, 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 were uh, sort of silly rules around payment and regulatory barriers that have mostly come down and I hope they stay down. So that's the biggest change. I, if telemedicine simply is a visit replacement, I don't think it's it's transformative. I mean, it's something, but it's not. It, it's it's doesn't. It's not the digital revolution that we've been waiting for. Where I think it's sort of disproportionately important is I think telemedicine becomes a bridge to a whole bunch of other <clears throat> sea changes in the way we deliver care. So, hospital at home was proven to be beneficial. You know, Bruce Leff's research at Hopkins on hospital home 30 years ago demonstrated you could take care of a whole lot of patients at home, much lower cost, equal outcomes, happier patients. And yet it didn't catch on at all because it's harder. I mean, it's how do you organize it? If, if for the ER doctor, if admitting a patient upstairs is I pick up the phone and I call somebody, if getting a patient to go to hospital home, I've got to make nine calls and call the oxygen company, call the social work company, call, that's just not gonna happen. So I think what, what telemedicine is helping to do is create a tipping point for a set of additional technologies. I think Hospital Home now has momentum it didn't have before. I think you're also going to see the enablement of home virtual care, home-based virtual care, partly because of telemedicine. So if, you know, if a patient is no longer coming in to see me in the office every three months, and it was during that office visit that I took their, you know, their glucose, their, their blood pressure, their weight, and that was the one data point I had every three months. Now they're not coming in, I'm doing televisit. Now I'm literally forced to use digital data that they took on their digital scale and their digital blood pressure cuff. <clears throat> and as long as I'm forced to do that, well, I might as well look at their daily blood pressure trend, not their Q3 month blood pressure trend. But then you say, okay, the technology is ready to do that. The digital blood pressure cuff is fine, but how the hell are we going to accept this new flow of continuous or semi-continuous data into our systems? And as soon as I hear, oh, it's gonna be fine, it's gonna to go to the primary care doctor, my BS detector goes completely wild. You know, wild because I have 300 primary care doctors that work for me and all of them would quit by five o'clock this afternoon if I told them we're gonna stream digital data on each of their 1700 patients to them directly and they should be happy because they can manage their patients better. I mean, that's, that's craziness. So I, I, I think that, that, that telemedicine as a sort of early tipping point for 
the breaking of the kind of geographic imperative that, that, that all visits, all care has to be delivered in this building that we own uh, and in this workflow that we have developed. And now we've got to think differently about, all right, that's not necessarily the case. The patient's going to be home. They're going to be collecting data at home. They may be sick at home. We're going to be monitoring them. They may answer a survey every morning about how their COPD is doing and breathe into their iPhone. And it's like, okay, great. How does that work? And clearly, if you put that on top of the chassis of the existing healthcare system, the system will break in five seconds. So that's interesting and exciting. And why I'm sort of disproportionately excited about telemedicine. I don't think it's telemedicine in and of itself. I think it's the sort of uh, the, 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 the potential that it becomes a bridge uh, to broader transformation. And, and I guess I'll add one more point, which is it also becomes a bridge potentially for a new way we think about uh, the organization of healthcare delivery. And by that, I mean, you know, I'm on, uh, I'm an advisor to Teladoc, so just, just FYI, uh, you know, here is a national company that can have a presence in every community in the country. And actually they have an international presence and they don't need buildings. Uh, you know, the Mayo Clinic 20 years ago said, we're an international brand. We want to branch out beyond Rochester, Minnesota. Um, how do we do that? Well, we're gonna build or buy, <laughs> you know, office buildings and hospitals in Scottsdale, Arizona and in, you know, Jacksonville, Florida. They don't have to say that anymore. They can say we can extend our brand through digital and through virtual in ways that challenge the geographic imperative of healthcare. And I think that's really interesting in a, in a disruptive way, in the same way that Amazon doesn't need a building in your town. They deliver what you ask for uh, as long as they're connected to a network of trucks. So I think that's uh, I think that could turn out to be a mega trend that uh, that telemedicine and and the pandemic sort of enable all of these things and it'll make the next decade pretty fascinating. That last five minutes is the best insight into the future of healthcare I think I've heard uh, in quite some time. Uh, I think it would be incredibly prescient. A lot to unpack there. One, Bruce Leff, if you miss him, we had him as a Chet Talk uh, guest uh, previously. You can just go to chettalks.org and listen to Dr. Bruce Leff, who 30 years ago conceived of hospital at home. Uh, second point, you touched on Medicare. These changes are temporary. Do you think Congress makes them permanent? I do. I think that I, I think the pressure, you know, the same way that when Uber came into your town, you know, everybody fought it. But once they were there, it became almost impossible to get rid of them because people just said, I want this. You don't think and hospitals so fight back against it and want to go back to the old ways and facility fees and parking? Uh, they'll fight a little bit. I don't think so, because I think for many hospitals, it's net positive if they kind of reorganize themselves in the right way. I think the pushback may be that Medicare may feel like payment parity is too generous, that if we're paying the exact same amount, but you don't have to have an office and, a, and someone to check in the patient and, you know, and, and plants in the lobby and all that kind of stuff, that, that paying you exactly the same for an office versus telemedicine visit may be too generous. They may dial that down a little bit. Um, and then thing was uh, building, do you think about uh, bigger changes? So are these smartphones, are these the new platforms for delivering healthcare and are more health assessments gonna be conducted over these things than in doctor's offices and hospitals? I think we'll have to figure that out. I, I, you know, there's, a, there's a fair amount that you can't do on that, on that device. Um, and there's a fair amount that you can do. I can tell you, one of the things that's most exciting about the digital transformation in the period we're in now is that um, starting three, four, five years ago, the, the world of Silicon Valley, and obviously it doesn't anymore live only in Silicon Valley, it lives all over the country and uh, the world, but the, the, the world of investors and startups and digital giants has seen the opportunity in healthcare now they've saw it, seen it for 50 years, and you know, uh, I mean, I was on Google Health's advisory board in 2005 when Google said we're going to transform healthcare because we're Google. And a year and a half into it, Eric Schmidt came in and told us they're taking it down because this is too hard. Everybody is back in, and the reason they're back in is they no longer have to digitize the data; it's already in your EHR. And so, the opportunity now to take digital data and take uh, uh, sort of an opportunity where both patients and clinicians are already online and remake those, you know, those ways of interacting so that you do what you do in every industry, which is sort of serve up to the people that need it, 
the information and the interfaces they need to conduct as much business as they possibly can virtually. And in most effective businesses there, you hit a point where, no, now we need to see you. You know, if I'm organizing a really, really complicated trip, I may actually need to see a travel agent. If I'm doing really complicated banking, I may actually need to go into the bank. And so I think there, we're gonna be testing those borders and those boundaries for a while, but I think the default setting will be that people now are used to getting a whole lot of services via their phone or other digital interfaces, that healthcare is lagged way behind, that uh, we're gonna be figuring out and mostly you know, new companies and or some of the digital giants will figure out new ways of delivering as much as they can via those devices and there'll be times where they overstep and there'll be times where it just doesn't work very well. And it's not like building a restaurant app. If they screw up and somebody dies, that's bad. And that's a lawsuit and, you know, fail fast has a limitation in, in, when it comes to healthcare. So it's going to be tricky to try to figure out what it's going to be, but you can see the arrows are all pushing to how do we deliver care that's more satisfying, uh, good outcomes at a lower cost. And inevitably, as in every other industry, that means taking people out of the mix when possible, delivering things to people in their homes when possible, and taking advantage of something we haven't really used very much yet. And I think it's been overhyped, but you know, how does artificial intelligence sort of weave into this so that the information that the patient is getting or the guidance they're getting is not necessarily because there's a doctor on the other end of the phone. Maybe there's a bot on the other end of the phone that's actually gotten smart enough to give good advice. I got some questions coming in. Maybe we'll keep them short so we can get uh, to a few of them. Uh, Gerardo Torres asks, why do you think so many months into the pandemic, we still don't have widespread prescription-free COVID-19 tests? Uh, there's been some regulatory barriers to it. I think it's, you know, the testing is, uh, is one area where the lack of a concerted, thoughtful, evidence-based government response uh, it was a screw up and set us behind forever. Testing's complicated, technologically complicated, but in some ways more logistically complicated and how do you interpret the test with false positives, false negatives and the nose versus the mouth versus, versus rapid versus not rapid versus PCR, it's tricky. And I think that is a lesson for the next pandemic. We have to have a testing infrastructure and apparatus. So somebody pushes a button when they hear of the virus emerging that sort of uh, brings forth a testing structure uh, that, that allows us to use testing effectively. I think it's been really kind of a poor response on the testing side. And now I think because of vaccination, it's almost too late in the game. I think people are gonna feel like, let's focus completely on getting people vaccinated. And so I think they're ignoring tests, so maybe a little bit more than they should. Harry Gawantor asked, to what extent do you think the creation of hospitalists have created less collegiality among physicians since we don't make rounds with each other, hang out in the lounge? Yeah, I, I mean, I, part of the reason that I sort of thought hospitals were a, good, were a good idea was the average primary care doctor 40 years ago came in the hospital at seven in the morning, didn't leave till 11 because he or she had 10 patients in the hospital day. And that number had gone down to one or two by 1996 when I coined the term. And so any primary care doctor who was dependent on his or her trip to the hospital for bagels and hot chocolate and schmoozing, I think that can't be where collegiality happens. I do think it's, it's a cost that, that, that they now, you know, most many primary care doctors never come to the hospital anymore. But at the same time, there are fewer one and two and three person practices, primary care offices. And I think we need to figure out, I can tell you most hospitals groups are very collegial within the hospital. And I think that many doctors now will spend their professional lives in ambulatory settings. They're, they're less and less likely to be in a two person practice, more and more likely to be in a larger practice and a multi-specialty practice. And I think we have to push on those practices to have, you know, what do you do to build collegiality? Conferences, uh, you know, grand rounds, all that. We've thought of those as being things you do in the hospital. But if you go to, you know, go to a Mayo Clinic, go to Intermountain, go to a large uh, uh, multi-specialty ambulatory practice, I think you start seeing people replicate the structures and the culture to try to deliver education and collegiality in those settings. I don't think depending on the hospital to do that for someone who spends a trivial amount of time in the hospital, I don't think that was gonna be the answer anyway. Michael Silver asks, what one action uh, could significantly unburden digital healthcare to move it significantly uh, to the next levels of care? 
The creation of a realistic app store like structure where it becomes trivially easy for someone to develop a really cool new digital tool that can easily bolt into your Epic or Cerner system without a whole lot of uh, friction. Uh, right now, that's a really hard thing to do. There's a lot of costs uh, to try to do the integration. And I think it gets in the way of the kind of innovation that we need. I think we've learned, I think we're entering the post electronic health record era. You're still gonna have an electronic health record, but increasingly the innovations are not gonna come from Epic or Cerner. They're gonna come from third party built tools. And, and to the extent that it's tricky to then connect those tools to your core enterprise electronic health record, it gets in the way. If that can be made easier, uh, and I would hope that Epic and Cerner and other companies would make it easier, but they may not see a business imperative to do that. So we need the government to help, or we need new technology tools that kind of bypass the obstacles and make it easier. If that was easier, it would be a huge catalyst for innovation. Uh, short answer for this one, if you can. In the digital doctor, you described the medical screen in settings such as elder care facilities. Can you elaborate? I'm not sure I remember that. Tell me what. <laughs> I didn't know did I. <laughs> so how about how about uh, digital medicine in uh, digital health for elder care facilities? Well, I, you know, if if they mean by elder care facilities, you know, sort of nursing homes, long term care facilities, and others, it's been a huge gap, and and and, and I think it's come at a cost in the pandemic uh, because you know these places generally don't have electronic health records or not connected to the core infrastructure that really is built around the electronic health record. So if there were a high tech 2.0 where we were gonna do something at a federal level to fund something, I think funding uh, electronic health records and, and a digital uh, way of doing digital health in long-term care facilities and doing the same thing in the public health system are really important. I think one of the things COVID pointed out you know, when I talked to the people at Google and Apple to develop that really cool contact tracing tool, part of the reasons it didn't go very far was they then needed to connect to the public health system to help, uh, you know, uh, sort of close the loop for contact tracing. And when they went into the public health systems, they found, uh, you know, they found string and, and, and soup cans. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, there, there is no digital infrastructure in the public health system. And I think that cost us in COVID and I think is one of the things we should invest in in preparation for the next pandemic. I'm going to have one follow-up question in a second. Uh, our next tech talk, next chat talk is with Carolyn McGill, the CEO of Ation and recent recipient of Rock Health Award for the Br Brightest Mind in Digital Health. She'll join us Tuesday, April 13th at 12 noon to discuss uh, real world evidence in healthcare. Tuesday, April 13th, Carolyn McGill, she's outstanding. Clearly, clearly you're not talking to the brightest mind in digital health. Right now. <laughs> that, that, that's been obvious for the last half hour. You, you, got, you, uh, you were number one on, uh, on modern healthcare's list of uh, top uh, people in medicine at one point in time. Bob. At one point, yeah. Uh, so Bob, 25 years ago, you foresaw the rise of hospitalists. Uh, 15 years ago, you were on the leading edge of the patient safety movement. Five years ago, you saw the emergence of the digital doctor. What's next on the horizon? What aren't we seeing? Uh, it, I think medicine's time has come for digital disruption. Uh, it's harder than people thought. It will take longer than it thought. But I, you know, people say, look how disrupted we have been. And I say, are you kidding me? You know, there are virtually no unemployed doctors, no unemployed nurses, very few hospitals have gone out of business, relatively little real patient care is delivered digitally, although as we've talked about, telemedicine has begun to transform that. I think, you know, I'm married to a journalist, so I, I know what it looks like when an industry is turned upside down. Uh, you know, to try to find a taxi driver if you want to find an industry that's been turned upside down. I think the next 10 years is going to be fascinating. And there's a whole lot of care that patients are going to get that may not be delivered by the incumbents. It's gonna be delivered by new digital companies using digital tools, using digital data. And we've also barely scratched the surface, right? Of, you know, we now have all of our data in digital form. My son does uh, analytics for, uh, for the Atlanta Braves as Moneyball. And I see what he can do with his data. He can tell you that this guy can't hit a lone outside curveball on Tuesday nights when the wind is out of the Southwest and the pitcher is over six foot two. And our sepsis alerts are wrong 30% of the time. You know, we have barely begun to take advantage of the digital data that we now have to be smarter, to make better diagnosis, to prescribe better treatments, to enable patients to do stuff for themselves. I think the next 10 years could be fascinating. And that's why I'm, you know, I finished writing the digital doctor 
you know, I wrote it and I spent a year doing research because I was so pissed off and disappointed by the first five or 10 years of digital. But I've come to believe that it was just because it was early and it's hard. And I think the next 10 years are gonna be really, really cool. Time for digital disruption of medicine has arrived. Uh, Dr. Wachter, thank you very much for all your time and all your efforts and all your insights and efforts on COVID, hospitalist patient safety and digital medicine. We're delighted that you're able to join us until uh, April 13th and we'll be with Carolyn McGill. Thank you very much for joining us on Chet Talks. Thank you.